Okay, it is noon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Amanda Roberts and I want to welcome you to Southern Illinois University School of Medicine's Rural Opioid Prescriber Training Webinar Series. The series is funded by the Illinois Department of Human Services, Division of Substance Use Prevention and Recovery through a grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today, methamphetamine use among people who use opioids will be presented by Dr. Strickland. He is an instructor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Strickland is a behavioral pharmacologist with expertise in the experimental evaluation of psychoactive drugs of varying drug classes. His research focuses on the use of behavioral economics as a theoretical framework to address issues of public health significance to include addiction and sexual health. This work applies a translational pipeline of preclinical animal research, human laboratory assessment, clinical trials, and epidemiological data to evaluate choice and decision-making processes at the intersection of the self and setting. Dr. Strickland is also interested in the behavioral mechanisms underlying psychedelic drug effects and contributes to clinical trials evaluating psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Thank you, Dr. Strickland, and I'll turn it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this works as well as it did earlier. And bah, 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 bah. hopefully that's working. Okay, right, I'm going to take no yeah. answer as a perfect. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining. Um, one point of housekeeping before I get started, um, I'm going to try to have the chat open. I can remember how to get it pulled open here uh, throughout. Um, so if you do have questions, uh, I'm going to monitor it. Um, any questions I think are probably better suited towards the end, I'll wait until the end to address. But if there's something you want to ask as I go, um, and it makes more sense to stop at that point, I'll, I'll certainly stop there. Um, uh, so again, thank you all for coming out here. I'm really looking forward to chatting about this today. Um, you may have noticed in the intro, uh, uh, very little of what I think I'll be talking about today was, was in there. Um, I am a, a research interests that are diversified or scattered, depending on who you ask. Uh, so uh, I'll touch on a little bit of the behavioral economic and decision-making stuff, but um, uh, no psychedelic-assisted therapy today. Uh, so before I get started, um, a few important notes. I don't have any actual or uh, potential conflicts of interest, but I do receive funding support from NIDA, um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Um, so as I was putting together this talk, I was, I was flipping through um, uh, popular press articles, doing a, a quick Google, uh, Google News search. And what many of you might have seen over the past two, three years is this very rapid uptick in the number of popular press articles regarding stimulant use in the United States, and, and in particular, methamphetamine use. Uh, here's one from NPR just this past year, articles describing this forgotten epidemic, how meth addiction is spreading across America, um, Mexican cartels are turning to meth and fentanyl production, um, also from NPR just this past December. Um, and so what I'm hoping to do today is uh, provide the, the state of the science of where we are with methamphetamine use in the United States, and in particular, how that is intersecting with um, what we've already established as a well, um, well characterized and um, often discussed uh, opioid overdose epidemic in, in the US. I mean, so to do that, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about a lot of things. And I'm going to be talking about what we know about the epidemiolo uh, epidemiological and um, public health impacts of opioid and uh, methamphetamine co-use um, and how that has changed and shifted over the past um, three to five years. Uh, and then I'm gonna be kind of building us from, from the bottom up and thinking about uh, the very mechanistic understanding, the neurobiological aspects of, of methamphetamine use uh, in, in uh, persons who use opioids. Um, working out to interpersonal aspects and what we know about motives underlying the use of methamphetamine and, and people who use opioids. And then finally, 
Um, frankly, what we mostly don't know about treatment uh, for this particular form of polysubstance use. Um, I'll touch on what we do know, which is mostly um, the lack of knowledge about what might work and the lack of treatments, um, but certainly talk about some things that uh, are on the horizon. Uh, so kind of set the stage, what is the epidemiology of methamphetamine use in the United States and how is that intersecting with the um, opioid overdose epidemic that we, uh, uh, we often discuss? And so I, I suspect many of you on this call, uh, if you've sat in on any uh, sort of talk regarding opioid use, have seen this, this over, overdose death uh, graph ad nauseum. Um, here we're looking at the number of uh, drug-involved overdose deaths from 1999 up to 2019. Um, there is some more recent data in 2020. Uh, it's shown very similar trends. And of course, as we've uh, known and discussed um, for the last decade now, we have seen this steady increase and rapid rise in overdose-related mortalities uh, underlying uh, first heroin and now more recently synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Um, but what we're beginning to recognize is a similar uh, trend occurring, although lagged in time, um, of psychostimulant-related overdose uh, mortalities. Uh, and so we see that here in the, these are very poorly colored, but light blue, um, here with methamphetamine, where we've seen this very drastic uptick in the last three to four years, and then also with cocaine, which again has uh, seen a similar rise in the past five years. And so if we really drill into these methamphetamine-involved overdoses, we can see that um, if we just look from 2011 to 2018 here, um, about a seven-fold increase overall across the United States, six to seven-fold increase um, that has disproportionately impacted um, uh, uh, some underrepresented groups, in particular American Indian and Alaska Native populations, which have seen overdose deaths rise to um, very astronomical 20.9 per 100,000 Indian population. Um, so this very rapid increase in methamphetamine-related mortalities um, that is uh, particularly concerning in the last, um, last few years. Now, if we drill into this even more and we think about how this might be intersecting with this known uh, epidemic of overdose mortalities uh, related to opioid use, um, we see that these two uh, seem to be intertwined in some way. So um, this blue bar here is the number of psychostimulant uh, mortalities. Uh, one thing I should have pointed out, so in our overdose mortality data in the United States, um, there isn't much of a distinction between methamphetamine and other prescription um, stimulants, um, but by and large, when we talk about psychostimulants with abuse potential and overdose deaths related to those, methamphetamine is mostly captured um, in that bucket. Um, and so this blue here is this increase in psychostimulants overall, mortalities related to psychostimulants. Um, the teal looking color is uh, psychostimulants without any opioid, and we've seen this kind of um, steady and still increasing rise in that. And then uh, what we're really seeing driving this increase in recent years is this um, apparent combination of synthetic opioids with psychostimulants, um, which was essentially zero back in 2015 and is now um, steadily increasing here in 2019 and, and beyond in our most recent data. Um, so this very apparent um, public health harm related to um, uh, overdose fatality related to this co-use um, of methamphetamine and opioids, as well as methamphetamine by itself. Um, so what does this look like in terms of prevalence rates and how the prevalence has changed of methamphetamine in the United States? For whom is this particularly a problem? Um, and so this was a paper from um, uh, uh, Matt Ellis and uh, um, Ted Cicero from University of Washington, at, uh, or WashU, um, WashU in St. Louis, a few years back. Um, that really first identified this problem um, outside of the overdose uh, fatality uh, information. So here we're looking at on the x-axis um, the year going from 2011 over to 2017, and then on the y-axis the prevalence of past month methamphetamine use. And this is data from a, a cohort of treatment centers and treatment clinics that um, uh, Matt and Ted have data on um, across the United States. And so what they found was that when you subset to folks that enter treatment for opioid use, there was this very marked, um, very consistent, very much matching the overdose uh, mortality rates, increase in the prevalence of methamphetamine use in these treatment-seeking tr 
treatment engaged populations. Um, jumping up from 19% or so in 2011, all the way up to 34% in 2017. Um, now, one possible criticism of this is it's a very niche um, kind of selected cohort of people, um, but they argued that this is probably something that's observed at a broader level and is indicative of a, a term that they coined uh, that's kind of gained traction in describing this as a, a twin epidemic, this twin epidemic of opioid use, which we already know about and the stimulant use increasing um, that's happening in parallel. Um, and so uh, some additional data um, that has been published since that used more national data sets. Uh, here we're looking at uh, TEDS data. So that's our one of our go-to um, uh, discharge related um, and intake related information regarding treatment within the United States, um, fairly well representing treatment centers across the US. And um, this is, oh, this is just overall the uh, number of drug-related treatment admissions related to um, methamphetamine use. And we see the steady increase really across populations um, and across age groups, races, geographic location, um, even in the Northeast, which is historically seldom seen methamphetamine use break into markets, uh, uh, the start of a tick up here and something that has increased since 2017 as well. Um, and so um, that's all treatment data. What about those folks that are that are not necessarily seeking treatment? Do they look different in any way? Um, so this is a, a set of analyses that um, I did in conjunction with a collaborator of mine, Jennifer Havens, out at University of Kentucky. Um, we used NSDUH data. Um, I suspect some of you are familiar, but for those of you who are not, NSDUH data um, are kind of our gold standard snapshot of drug use in America every year. Um, they're limited in that they don't capture um, institutionalized populations, so those in the criminal justice system. Um, they somewhat capture um, uh, houseless populations, um, but not well. Um, and so they tend to underrepresent uh, uh, drug use in America, but they, they give us this representative-ish um, snapshot. And so what we did was we looked at, um, in the time frame spanning from 2015 to 2019, um, amongst people that used various classes of drugs, to use opioids, use stimulants, to use cannabis, used alcohol, used um, any of the classes that, that are collected and that, that you might think of, um, what did rates of past month methamphetamine use look like? And what we saw was this very um, dramatic and very similar sort of trend, um, very disturbing trend in the rates of methamphetamine use amongst people that use heroin. Um, so broadly speaking, folks that are likely um, meeting criteria uh, for uh, opioid use disorder with, the, with a past month of heroin use, or at least near that. Um, and so this is going from 9% of those uh, folks were using methamphetamine back in 2015, and this climbed to almost fivefold, um, over fivefold, to no, just under fivefold, uh, to 44% in uh, 2019. Um, and an important caveat here is that this is uh, a very striking trend and one that's mostly only apparent in this population of people that are using opioids and here specifically using heroin. Um, and so here in the, the green, we're seeing the green squares. We're seeing for people that use cocaine, the, the rates of methamphetamine use have largely held stable just right around 10%. And we can drill down even further. Um, in the black here, we're looking at those same heroin data going all the way back to 20, uh, 2006 um, and the rates of methamphetamine use across time. Um, one thing you'll note is that for people that use heroin, methamphetamine is always more prevalent, um, but it is strikingly more pre prevalent in uh, the past few years. And we're nowhere near seeing the same sorts of trends occurring um, in folks that are using benzos or using prescription stimulants or using cocaine or using these other drugs and drug classes. So this very unique uh, and, and particularly troublesome profile of co-use occurring. Um, so I, I mentioned as I was starting to go through this, um, uh, what what sort of people is is this form of co-use uh, particularly prevalent and particularly pronounced for. Um, and so what we did was we, we further drilled down into these data and we asked um, for this group of people that used heroin in, uh, uh, recently, what was particularly predictive of also using methamphetamine? So what sort of um, uh, factors are associated 
the uh, predictive risk of this form of co-use. Um, I don't expect that you necessarily are going to uh, transfer these numbers to something uh, particularly informative. Um, but what you'll find is that many of the things that are associated with increased risk of harm, past year injection, drug use, serious mental illness, the lack of receiving treatment for past year uh, uh, drug use, or uh, lack of receiving drug use treatment in the past year, were each associated with methamphetamine use. So for example, um, only about 30% uh, of folks without serious mental illness uh, that were also using heroin used methamphetamine, but it was up to 50 for those with SMI. Um, I recognize I'm also talking to a rural prescribing group. Um, I should have caveated with, I have some rural data, but it's not going to be a whole talk about rurality. Um, but of particular concern, this, uh, this pattern of co-use seems um, especially prevalent in rural areas. Um, so about 50% of those that are using heroin in rural areas are also using methamphetamine and compare that to about 30% in non-rural jurisdictions. Um, and so uh, Jin and I um, uh, uh, kind of dug into this a little bit further using um, a really rich data set that she's collected over the last, um, over a decade now out in Eastern Kentucky. So um, uh, this is a cohort study that uh, was started in 2008 um, as a social network cohort study of about 500 people. Um, I put up these graphs just to highlight uh, kind of the uh, interconnectedness of the oops, interconnectedness of this sample um, and kind of this close knit rural community. Um, and so uh, this cohort of folks have been followed for the past, as I said, about 12 years um, and about 500 of them, all of which were reporting some form of non medical prescription opioid use at that baseline in 2008. And so what we did was we, we looked into the, um, the prevalence of various forms of injection drug use, so particularly um, a form of use with high public health harm. Um, and what we saw at first was when you look at non-medical prescription opioid injection um, amongst this cohort, um, it was very high amongst uh, people who injected at baseline um, and relatively stable over almost a 10-year period, started to level off and really plummeted in 2019, which on face value looks very good um, until you look at the corresponding rates of methamphetamine injection. So um, methamphetamine showing this kind of parallel uptick from 2016 to 2018 and this dramatic increase um, in most recent years. Uh, and so this, this very uh, uh, um, harmful form of, of co-use, co-use of both uh, non-medical prescription opioids and methamphetamine uh, via injection, I'm occurring in this, this cohort of participants. And just the final thing I'll, I'll put up, not that I think it takes much convincing to argue why co-use of, of drugs, and in particular co-use of opioids and stimulants, might pose um, unique public health uh, implications. But um, just some work here uh, done, again, within SDUH, um, looking at specific health harms related to opioid use only, methamphetamine use only, and this co-use pattern. Um, and just to, to pull out a few things, again, we see this uh, increase of uh, health-related harms and public health-related harms um, when this co-use pattern is present, increased risk of or association with cardiovascular disease, um, infection disease transmission, which is likely linked to an increased uh, probability of injection drug use, um, and then this increased rate of serious mental illness, which um, likely presents in increased barriers when one enters treatment. And so taking this all together, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of data that suggests uh, kind of one very straightforward but unified conclusion, which is that uh, we're seeing this very drastic increase in stimulant use in the United States, particularly methamphetamine, and that this form of methamphetamine use seems to be one that is particularly pronounced for those that are um, either previously or currently using um, non-medical opioids, whether that be prescription opioids um, or uh, heroin or fentanyl. Um, and so what can we as, as researchers, as clinicians, as stakeholders in the community do about this um, from a preventative standpoint, from a treatment standpoint, um, from a public health standpoint? 
and so for the rest of it, I'm going to kind of talk from a from a bottom up and thinking about um, this form of co-use and this this pattern of co-use, um, polysubstance use, in the United States. And I'm I'm going to very briefly talk on neurobiology. I recognize this is a, a much more probably clinically oriented audience, but I think it's it's good to think a little bit about neurobiological mechanisms and and what. Uh, might be underlying uh, an inter interaction with environmental and socioeconomic and um, contextual factors, um, this emergence of uh, polysubstance use. Um, and so don't worry about the, the fancy brain slides. I'm gonna talk about these in a very brief way and in a way that's not necessarily uh, um, uh, needed to get in depth to. Um, but when we talk about opioid use and we talk about opioid use as it relates to drug reward. Um, a lot of this happens uh, in the area of the brain, nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area via these um, uh, dopamine neurons that fire off to reward systems in the brain. And under normal conditions, these uh, GABAergic, uh, the inhibitory neuron in the brain, um, interneurons and projections are act acting as this almost um, stopgate for these dopamine neurons. And they act to kind of regulate, and make sure that firing is at a right level, but not too much. Now, when opioid, uh, opioids are present, mu opioids, mu opioid agonists, uh, things like morphine and heroin and fentanyl, any of our kind of prototypic opioids, uh, when these are present, they bind to these GABAergic interneurons, and when that occurs, these uh, dopamine neurons are disinhibited, meaning that they uh, are able to fire at a rate that is higher than typical and can produce greater than normal reward and reinforcement um, within the system. Now, this is a very simplified, and oversimplified notion of this, but this is generally speaking how opioids um, under kind of typical, typical states are regulating and leading to reward and reinforcement that can continue their use um, despite negative consequences. Now, how do stimulants come into this? Um, I should note that this is a, a actually somewhat speculative um, a notion of, of stimulant use in the context of opioid use. Um, behavioral researchers and experimental researchers and neuroscientists often act as drugs, uh, drugs happen in a vacuum and that drug classes and drug use happens in silos. You have opioid use, you have stimulant use, you have alcohol use, rather than thinking about how poly use is really the norm and not the exception. And so there isn't a, a lot of great um, a theory building about cross-drug interactions, but the general idea here is that um, there's fairly good preclinical evidence to suggest that long-term opioid exposure increases these um, dopaminergic, oh, sorry, I keep doing that, uh, increases the activity uh, and the uh, receptivity of these dopamine D2 receptor neurons in that nucleus accumbens VTA area. And through a cascade of a series of, of interactions with other areas in the brain, I won't get too much into, um, this leads to this sensitivity, this increased sensitivity to dopamine agonists. Dopamine agonists include our prototypic stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine. And it's after this extended period of opioid exposure and uh, following um, abstinence that we see the sensitivity start to emerge. And theoretically, this sort of um, uh, this change in the, the underlying neurobiological substrates can lead to this increased uh, reward and reinforcement from stimulants like cocaine or methamphetamine. And so what does that look like kind of at a practical level? Um, so this is, this is some work, um, uh, um, you'd think I would learn after a year of doing Zoom talks, two years of doing Zoom talks, how my mouse and keyboard work. Uh, so this is some work with Ryan Lacey. He is a, a preclinical behavioral pharmacologist up at Franklin and Marshall, a good friend and colleague. Um, and um, uh, what we wanted to do was see how, um, at a very basic level, this uh, prior exposure to opioids can influence something like stimulant reinforcement and reward. It sounds like a very straightforward question to ask, um, but hasn't been actually tackled as much as one might expect. Um, and part of that is in the clinical world, we uh, don't have 
the experimental control one might have over previous history and the uh, um, previous exposure that one might have to drugs and there's interactions with things like environment and context, which while important, can't isolate these sort of neurobiological aspects. Um, and so this was a, a preclinical study, a rodent self-administration study. And what we, we asked a very simple question of how do um, uh, subjects that have a prior hif history of being exposed to remifentanyl, so remifentanyl is a very short acting, um, potent, mu opioid agonist. How do those uh, animals that have this history differ from those that don't have this history in, current, in terms of their demand um, for cocaine? Um, I won't go too much into demand, but essentially on this top graph, higher is worse. And on this bottom graph, higher is, is better, lower is worse. Um, the top graph is this sort of unconstrained consumption measure and the bottom graph is how sensitive one is to negative consequences and use despite those negative consequences. And so what we find is that uh, uh, without a prior remifentanyl history, later exposure to opioids doesn't impact that current cocaine demand. We wouldn't expect it to, it happens after we're measuring uh, that cocaine use. But when we look at these animals that have this uh, extensive pr uh, pre-exposure to remifentanyl, we see this um, uh, exposure dependent uh, increase in the um, uh, reinforcing effects and this related demand for cocaine such that those animals that had the, the most exposure um, showed this greater, uh, very large increase in both cocaine demand and this greater insensitivity to consequences essentially using cocaine still despite the negative consequences. It's indicative of this greater rewarding value um, of the drug. Um, so this is, of course, um, preclinical research, so it doesn't interact with those sort of environmental and contextual factors that um, uh, clearly and obviously drive um, uh, use and use patterns, um, but is indicative of this, this kind of notion of increased sensitization um, to a stimulant following this chronic opioid exposure, and maybe a, one of these risk factors underlying, underlying this transition pattern. Um, I mentioned that work in the human world is, is relatively sparse, again, because we don't have that sort of experimental control. Um, but there is an uh, older study, so I apologize for some of the fuzziness, but an older study looking at um, the response of um, uh, people who were either um, had previous exposure uh, to maintenance on uh, methadone, so our mu, again, a mu opioid agonist, in this case, much longer acting, typically used as an MOUD, medication for opioid use disorder. Um, so those that had extensive experience with that, so long-term opioid exposure in the white, and then those that had no prior extensive opioid exposure in the black. And what's compared here is uh, drug response to increasing doses of cocaine, so our, our dopamine agonist or stimulant. And what we find is a very similar story emerge where the, the positive subjective effects of cocaine are much greater in those with this uh, previous methadone exposure history. Um, now, of course, there's all sorts of other factors that could explain this, but very consistent with what we see um, in the preclinical domain. Um, and so just some, some very broad based conclusions based on this neurobiological research. Um, uh, we seem to see a pattern of, um, of uh, physiological and, and neurobehavioral changes that suggests once physical dependence occurs on an opioid, there's the state of dopamine supersensitivity that begins to develop very soon after abstinence from an opioid begins. So very soon into this um, withdrawal um, period. And that this supersensitivity to drugs that function as dopamine agonists, primarily um, sub-threshold dose of um, uh, um, dopamine agonists like cocaine or methamphetamine, but also very uh, low doses of opioids can um, and uh, engage the dopamine agonist system, as I mentioned, um, that this appears to increase as the abstinence period continues. This is some research I didn't talk about, but this seems to be a very protracted sensitivity. Um, it's not just shortly after the exposure to opioids ends, but continues long into a withdrawal and protracted withdrawal period. And so from a clinical standpoint, um, this provides some credence to why we might be seeing this co-use pattern emerge, uh, particularly amongst those that initially started in this um, opioid um, uh, opioid use pattern. Um, 
Simulant and opioid co-use might confer this greater euphoric effect. Simulants might remediate some of the symptoms of acute withdrawal and re, uh, reinforce the co-use pattern in that way. Um, and that generally speaking, this, this kind of mismatches expectations of hypodopaminergic activity during withdrawal with an increased sensitivity to uh, agonists like cocaine and methamphetamine um, might manifest as this sort of differential craving that we observe um, in clinical settings. Again, I should note a lot of this is um, a bit informed speculation about this co-use pattern, but um, informed by kind of this existing neurobiological research we have. Um, when we, uh, so, so that's from a neurobiological perspective. And as I mentioned, I'm mostly an experimental psychologist and behavioral pharmacologist. And so that's where, where my head is a lot. But um, one thing that we in the kind of experimental world very undervalue and don't necessarily incorporate into our research that can be particularly enlightening um, is good qualitative work and qualitative research that digs into um, people with lived experiences, lived experience, and, and directly asking why these sorts of patterns of, of use emerge, um, why they develop, why they end, um, and, and, uh, and the like. So um, I mentioned uh, Jennifer Haven's uh, cohort out in Kentucky. And so, so what they did after we identified this um, initial very striking pattern of, of co-use and, and transition and use to methamphetamine, um, they did a really excellent qualitative um, study with um, a subset of folks that had transitioned to initiating methamphetamine use. Um, and that's very straightforward and simple questions. Why did you transition? What sort of contextual factors and cultural factors and um, interpersonal factors uh, supported or inhibited that transition? And they put together this, this really excellent paper that just recently came out. Um, highlighting some of these, these factors that uh, do or do not um, uh, facilitate that, that transition pattern. And I'm going to talk about a few and, and talk about them both from qualitative work done as well as some experimental work supporting uh, that qualitative work. Um, but some of the motives that came out were that methamphetamine was used as this means to mitigate opioid withdrawal, so as a very self-guided treatment pathway. Um, that methamphetamine acted as this cheaper substitute for heroin or as a substitute that was perceived as safer following spikes in opioid overdose fatalities, largely due to um, the adulteration of opioid supply with fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Um, and then also opioids and stimulants, um, particularly methamphetamine, can create this uh, new and different and synergistic high that's, that's better than either one alone. And so thinking back to those clinical implications I just discussed, um, these map on actually really well to those. And so breaking down kind of each of these, these in turn, um, uh, and thinking about the mitigation of opioid withdrawal, I'm in the next kind of 10 minutes or so, gonna walk through some of the direct quotes because I think it's valuable to hear them. But um, one, one patient or participant in that study um, mentioned that meth will stop withdrawal. Did you know that? For anything, it stops it for any kind of drug, Xanax, Neurontin, pain pills, Suboxone. So a lot of people have used meth to get off Suboxone. So again, this very uh, self-initiated, self-guided pathway to treatment. And this pathway to treatment that might be occurring um, for a variety of reasons in the absence of access to treatment resources, um, in the access, uh, absence of um, uh, stable treatment. Um, this is a rural cohort, so in the access of uh, transportation and other barriers that, that are met in terms of receiving treatment. Um, and just another here, this is actually another qualitative study of patients um, that were in MOUD programs, either currently or, or historically, um, found a very similar uh, theme emerge regarding opioid withdrawal. Um, this one patient regarded, I'm getting out of the buprenorphine program, they're titrating me down rapidly, and so I've been sick for a week. They say I'll be sick for weeks more. I've been doing so much more meth just to try to deflect the pain. Uh, it's just that you can't do it without another drug. I feel like you can't do it without another, especially if you have a job or responsibility or kids. There's no way. Um, so I think really, really important quotes to, to keep in mind and, and very similar themes emerged from others, um, that this, this form of polysubstance use 
using methamphetamine with opioids isn't necessarily um, something that's strictly driven by reward or um, uh, positive euphoric effects, but also may be a form of self-medication. I'm in a form of uh, self-treatment when access to those uh, important treatment resources isn't there. Um, one, one thing just to note is, so a lot of these patients are mentioning that stimulants are great for, um, and methamphetamine in particular is great for uh, opioid withdrawal. We actually don't really have great empirical information about whether that is the case or not. Um, on face value, you can kind of think of a good argument one way or the other. Um, there is one um, particularly interesting paper from the, the early 90s that looked at, um, uh, uh, again, preclinically naloxone precipitated withdrawal and looked at the effects of cocaine administration on that naloxone precipitated withdrawal and actually found rather pronounced um, reductions in withdrawal across a full time course here. So emerging around 15 minutes and up to an hour, um, pretty stark reductions in, in withdrawal uh, symptoms emerging. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have a great handle on if methamphetamine or whatever it might be is actually helping, uh, at least in acute sense and chronic sense, it's probably not, but in acute sense, um, whether this kind of uh, um, uh, folk pharmacology and um, um, uh, armchair pharmacology is, is uh, beneficial, um, but it might be. Um, so the, the second two, or the second and the third I mentioned is substitute or using despite, or using uh, as a safer alternative, uh, speaks to the broader notions of, of thinking of methamphetamine as the substitute for heroin. So again, one patient uh, here in a, a third qualitative study um, mentioned, yeah, it's crystal methamphetamine, a bit of sub substitute, a big substitute, actually. It just sort of satisfied me much the same way heroin, uh, that heroin did. This was a patient that was in a methadone treatment program. Um, and so I mentioned I wasn't going to talk too much behavioral economics, but I, this was an opportune time to bring in a little bit of that empirical work I do. And so when we talk about, um, talk about drugs, we talk about anything um, and the decision to uh, use a drug or the decision to not use a drug or use a different alternative good. One really uh, valuable way to think about them is from this sort of um, uh, um, substitute complement demand perspective. And so um, if you think about the cost, uh, let's think about red here as heroin. And we think about the cost of, we think about the cost of heroin um, and it's increasing cost. Um, uh, and that cost might be the actual price, but it also can be factors like the risk of heroin use or the, um, uh, the difficulty in obtaining heroin. Um, we would expect that with increasing cost, and we, we you do see this um, even in people with um, uh, significant substance use um, problems, that cost can be a driver of decreases in use. Now, what becomes interesting is when you start looking at other other drugs or other um, commodities and available in the environment. And so we can think about a commodity that might be available um, while the cost is increasing, and that commodity might increase in price or increase in consumption with the increase in price of the other good. And so a very simple example of this is we can think about uh, Coke and Pepsi. If Coke gets really expensive, Pepsi is gonna, we're gonna increase our consumption of Pepe, Pepsi, even if Coke is absolutely better and we prefer Coke hands down to Pepsi. And so um, this is the sort of relationship um, that we refer to as a, a substitute relationship, um, not surprisingly. Um, and so we might, um, what one mechanism, one motive by which um, many folks are transitioning to a methamphetamine use pattern is um, this kind of very straightforward pattern of heroin is increasingly costly, heroin is increasingly um, uh, difficult to find, is less pure, is more adultered, is uh, more expensive. Um, and methamphetamine, on the other hand, is increasingly prevalent, is increasingly cheap, is increasingly pure. And even if one prefers one over the other, there comes a point at which these cost offset and uh, a substitution pattern can merge. Um, there's not many studies that have looked at this sort of relationship necessarily, um, but there is one interesting study uh, uh, from uh, here, the late 80s, 
that had a cohort of uh, patients that entered treatment for opioid use disorder and looked at the relationship of cocaine use to treatment. Uh, and what they did was they broke this up, you'll see by uh, detox only, methadone maintenance, drug-free treatment, and looked at the incidence of uh, never starting cocaine use, decreasing the level of cocaine use, and increasing the level of cocaine use. And the major take home here is you, you see a kind of a little bit of everything, but you do see a significant proportion of uh, patients here initiating the stimulant use pattern, in this case, cocaine. Um, and this is something, um, I'm not a clinician, but interfacing often with um, uh, MAUD uh, clinics and, and other um, uh, patient-facing uh, contexts that we do see in the clinic that occurs. And we see this initiation of stimulant use. And, and some of this might um, relate to this sort of substitution pattern. When you take away um, the opioid within the context of treatment, um, and you don't replace it with some sort of non-drug alternative or access to non-drug alternative in one's life, um, you're going to see the stimulant use pattern emerge. And the reason for stimulants can be multifaceted, um, uh, as we discussed earlier. Um, and the last, the last motive um, that, that came up um, in some of those quali that qualitative work is this, this notion of a synergistic high. So here in this combination, this combination being methamphetamine and heroin together, um, it actually boosts the heroin. It makes heroin a sensation stronger. It brings on the aroma of the heroin, but you're also doing this in a state where you want to be tinkering and doing things or where you can drift off. Um, and so we saw some of this uh, evidence for this in the context of that uh, methadone study I mentioned earlier. Um, going back to these sort of relationships uh, we were discussing, you can think about um, drugs as complements up here on the top, but you can also, or substitutes up here on the top, but you can also think of them as complements. And here, what you see is as the cost of some drug gets increasingly high, um, the use of the other uh, will kind of uh, go down concor concurrently. Um, real world or kind of uh, um, general example, of this is hot dogs and hot dog buns. Hot dogs get expensive. You're not going to buy a bunch of hot dog buns. They complement one another. You want both of them um, or you want nothing. And just, just one, uh, again, example here. This was a, a clinical study with, um, with Ryan uh, where we looked at uh, how cocaine and heroin interact. Um, in terms of reward and reinforcement, um, I should say this is absolutely not the only example of this, but just one example that I was involved in, so it was easy enough to pull the data from. Um, but what you find is that uh, as the dose of cocaine increases, rats are more willing to press for it, but that this interacts um, tremendously with uh, very low doses of heroin, such that doses of heroin that on their own don't do much um, synergize with uh, the stimulant to produce this greater uh, reward and reinforcing effect. Um, now you might see the kind of big hole here on the second half and this kind of segues nicely to the last bit of the talk I'll get to today. Um, this was actually a study of looking at exercise as a, a, a non-drug uh, intervention for um, opioid use, stimulant use, in this case, uh, co-use patterns. Um, perhaps not surprisingly uh, for anyone who is has a, a, a ear in on the, the exercise literature, um, produced very robust decreases in, in uh, substance use. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about exercise as a treatment. I think, uh, again, not from a clinician's perspective, exercise tends to be a very positive uh, intervention for essentially everything, but one that is very difficult to implement and encourage continued use of. Um, so certainly positive here, but um, some, uh, uptake barriers that make it more difficult. Um, uh, so that was a bit about motives and what we know about um, why, um, at least uh, in, in a broad sense, folks uh, might be initiating this co-use pattern. Um, and the remainder of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to be talking about treatment. And I'll preface this with kind of, well, two important caveats. The first is that I'm certainly not a clinician, as I've said now probably about three or four times, and so I'm not we're going to be talking more about experimental studies that show um, uh, particular signals for clinical uh, interventions, um, not necessarily any sort of approved um, intervention, because there are very few of those for substance use. Um, and that segues to the second point, which is we actually know very little about treatment. Um, uh, as, I, as I noted, substance use tends to be thought of in very siloed ways, and we 
we tend to think of treating opioid use or treating stimulant use or treating alcohol use. And um, we certainly have difficulties doing just that. Um, so um, we often don't even, we don't think about the sort of the norm of polysubstance use and, and how we tackle um, uh, polysubstance use uh, patterns within a clinical setting, or at least we do it less often. So I'm gonna be talking about just kind of two broad based ways we can think about treatment of um, methamphetamine use in people that use opioids. Uh, the first is pharmacologically. Um, pharmacological interventions for substance use, um, particularly opioid use are, are been very strong. Um, we have MOUDs, uh, so the medications for opioid use disorder. Um, and we have um, some medications for alcohol use um, that do produce very positive um, beneficial effects. Um, with that said, the, the development of a medication for uh, novel medication for substance use disorder is, is kind of a, a very heavy lift. Um, and that's for a few reasons. One of them is from a, from a, trans, uh, from a developmental perspective, the, the money that comes in from developing a CNS medication is already low and it's particularly low when we talk about substance use disorders. Um, and so often what we're doing as, as preclinical researchers, as experimental researchers, as clinical researchers, is repurposing prior medications and looking at how they might impact um, uh, a uh, substance use uh, indicators in the lab or in the clinic. And so just one example here, this is some work uh, during uh, my graduate training with uh, uh, Bill Stoops and Craig Rush out at University of Kentucky. Um, uh, we can look at how a uh, already FDA approved medication, so easy to bring um, into a clinic, uh, so buspirone here, um, so atypical anxiolytic kind of, um, and approved as an atypical anxiolytic uh, that uh, it primarily has uh, dopaminergic D D3 uh, receptor activity and uh, serotonergic activity. Um, how that shifted uh, these laboratory-based measures of physiology, physiology, subjective effects, and actual drug taking. Um, and unfortunately, the take home here is really, it did a whole lot of nothing to methamphetamine. Um, here, this is intranasal methamphetamine um, in people with stimulant use disorders. And you can see that while methamphetamine itself produced very robust response across these measures, we see very little shift after maintenance on this, uh, this pharmacological manipulation. And unfortunately, this little vignette uh, is just, just one example of the, the kind of many failures we've had in terms of developing a medication for stimulant use disorders, and, and especially a stimulant use disorder uh, with comorbid opioid use. Um, and so uh, this is just a, a systematic review. And I was going to put up the, um, the uh, forest plots that show the effect sizes for things. But I think their highlights do it a bit better, which just emphasize we haven't tested a lot of medications in folks that have comorbid use. Those that we've tested don't work so well. Uh, and the ones that seem to work uh, are psychomotor stimulants, and those have a very uh, hard barrier in terms of implementation in an actual, um, uh, by the FDA, given their use liability. So from a pharmacological agent uh, angle, not a whole lot out there, although certainly we should, we should continue trying. Uh, from a behavioral perspective, I'm just going to talk about one intervention today, and I realize we're getting close to time, and I won't leave uh, plenty of time for questions, but the one I'm going to talk about is contingency management. Um, some of you may be familiar with contingency management. It's also uh, referred to sometimes as motivational incentives. Um, this is an intervention that's based in uh, primarily operant and behavioral psychology that uses a contingent um, reward to incentivize some sort of behavior. Um, either the presence or the absence of it. So in the context of substance use, this is typically incentivizing a drug negative urine um, at a clinic visit by some sort of voucher or other reward that is uh, considered desirable. Um, and kind of across the board in terms of behavioral interventions, this is really one of our most robust interventions in reducing substance use. Um, here, just one example with methamphetamine use, we see this um, contingency management groups showing nearly double, although varying over time, um, rates of abstinence uh, relative to a treatment as usual with had kind of a Cadillac of other um, interventions on board. And I bring CM up um, or contingency management because there was recently a, a really excellent meta-analysis that was done by uh, uh, Steve Higgins group up at University of Vermont, 
where they collapsed all the trials that have looked at um, uh, CM for stimulant use in the context of opioid use disorder. And what they found was there was this very robust and very strong um, uh, promotion of abstinence um, amongst active groups, um, an effect size of about point, Cohen's D of 0.7, which is from just rules of thumb, exceptionally large effect size. Um, and so a, a really strong behavioral intervention here. Um, now, anyone on this call with some familiarity with CM might be shaking their head and saying, well, CM is great, but it's not feasible or not practical. And, and that's true. Um, there's a lot of barriers to implementing CM. Uh, there's uh, reimbursement related issues, especially as it relates to anti-kickback laws. Um, and even if you could get that fixed, where does the money even come from? Um, but what I'll end on is maybe a positive note in terms of the implementation of CM within actual clinic settings. Um, so this is from the Biden-Harris administration statement on drug policy um, that was uh, put out the first year of office. And there was actually a very explicit call out of CM in there um, for stimulant use disorders. So identifying and addressing policy barriers, um, and specifically exploring reimbursement as it relates to motivational incentives. Um, in addiction and especially stimulant use disorders. So some recognition at a kind of a policy level of the benefit of these sorts of interventions. And so with that in mind, uh, we talked a bit today about the epidemiology of, of opioid and stimulant co-use, um, some about the neurobiology, um, qualitative work and related experimental work exploring motives underlying use. Um, and then finally some, um, some of the information we know about interventions, but largely the, the kind of lack of interventions that we do have on hand uh, to readily address the problem. And the last thing I'll, I'll say before for turning it over to uh, question time is just to emphasize um, that while some of the things I talked about today, and I certainly emphasize some of the unique facets of methamphetamine that might be driving this co-use pattern, that, that this transition from opioid to stimulant uses is actually one that's probably very predictable about how we handle drug policy and how we handle public policy in, the, in um, addressing substance use in the United States. And um, the extent to which we address um, specific problems that uh, kind of um, uh, may help in the short term in terms of um, uh, removing uh, opioids from a market or making it more difficult to obtain them, versus addressing more structural and, and systematic and systemic barriers that can result in these sort of substitution patterns of shifting from just one drug to another based on availability. And so I'll just encourage anyone thinking about um, uh, treatment and thinking about um, societal and community factors um, when they're thinking about this emerging epidemic to, to not only think of it as this twin epidemic of opioid and methamphetamine use, but an enduring endemic of how um, we think about uh, substance use in, in America and, and treat and help and um, uh, provide services. And so uh, just some acknowledgments to great people I get to work with um, at Hopkins, at University of Kentucky, other universities, um, and then of course funding support I received from NIDA um, for this work and other. Um, and then finally some contact info. Um, feel free to reach out if you have questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, I think I left less time than expected, uh, but at least some time for a, a Q&A period if there is uh, any questions. Um, but again, feel free to reach out if uh, you're more comfortable asking them uh, at a later time. And on face value, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I may be not using the chat correctly, which is also a distinct possibility. I do not see any questions in the chat either. Um, I do want to take a second. We'll, we'll see if any questions roll through. Just to thank you, Dr. Strickland. This was a very robust and um, informative, very helpful presentation. So thank you so much for that. Um, also, just want to let the attendees know we thank you for attending today's session of the Rural Opioid Prescriber Training Series. And oh, we have oh, just a it's a, it's a very nice it's not a, I, I, yeah it's not a question but it's a very nice uh, 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 thank you so yes and I will post um, let me see 
So in order to claim your CME credit, you can use the QR code, or I will also post a link that you can utilize in the chat as well. So with that, Dr. Strickland, I don't believe there are any questions for you. So once again, Perfect. thank you so very much um, for yeah. your time today. Great. And if anyone has something, feel free to reach out. Um, but thank you all for having me. This was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, enjoy uh, uh, no more snow. No more snow out there. Is that yes. is that right? That's correct. No snow? Okay. <laughs> That's my personal um, vote anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.